Today I'm going to talk about a particular <clears throat> work that I was involved in uh, with the IPVS. Uh, that is about the assessment of land degradation and restoration. Uh, IPVS does a range of things. I'm not sure to what extent we know about that. What is IPVS, this awkward acronym? Do we know? Okay. That gives me pleasure to introduce it. <laughs> Otherwise, I should have jumped into the, what we did. So what I'll do is to talk about what is IPBES, what it does very briefly, and then come into the particular work in which I was involved in, which is about assessing the land degradation and restoration scenarios, looking at uh, two broad categories of literature. I'll talk about that. And this slide is directly borrowed from IP base, so I think we are advised to use this as an opening slide. So then I'll move into our regular slides. <laughs> so let me give you a bit of idea about what is IP base, if you are unfamiliar with this. This is, um, the full name is the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. It was established in 2012 as an independent intergovernmental body by the Conference of Parties to CBD, Convention on Biological Diversity. Uh, now they ha there are more than 130 member countries and other organizations like EU as a member of this uh, institution. Basically, uh, what it does is in response to government's request, because it was established by the government, so to responding to government's request, it provides policymakers with some objective scientific assessments about the state of knowledge regarding the planet's biodiversity, ecosystems, and their contribution to people. So the nature's contribution to people is the word that IPBES has been using, which in our ordinary way of thinking is ecosystem services or benefits of ecosystem services. So it does that service. And also, it also provides that knowledge regarding tools and methods to protect and sustainably use these vital resources. In doing so, it also suggests or provides some options for responses based on the best available evidence. So what it means, uh, they run different type of assessments. I'll come to what that means. And based on that, what the evidence is telling us about the particular question they are exploring, and then put that in the form of policy relevant message. That's the word they use. So they do that. Uh, its fundamental mission is to strengthen knowledge foundation for better policy through science, for the conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity, long-term human well-being, and sustainable development. So very broad. In a nutshell, uh, I can refer it as IPBES does for biodiversity, what IPCC does for climate change. That's how they say. So this is the type of institution trying to work towards biodiversity conservation and ecosystem services in the same spirit, but it is relatively new, established in 2012. What are its operating principles? There are some things which are new to this. One is, obviously, this is common to other uh, institutions like this. Be scientifically independent and ensure credibility, relevance, and legitimacy of its work provide policy relevant information, not the policy prescriptive advice. So that's the difference. As you know, we, when we work with governments or policymakers, and some of the verbs that we use in our language are not that um, very, um, very attractive, or those verbs like should, must, ought to, and that sort of verbs when you use framing messages or recommendations. Even though the message is clear, but they somehow annoy people. And they don't use that. They frame it as if and then type of terminology. And they say, this is policy relevant information we are providing to you. It's your decision, rather than policy prescriptive message. So the other thing they do is recognize and respect the contribution of indigenous and local knowledge. So this is something IPBES is pushing hard in order to bring the indigenous and local communities and their knowledge system in order to look at the biodiversity and ecosystem services and so forth. The way it works, um, this is a simple uh, schematic diagram how it works. The IPBS secretariat is in Bonn. 
main workhorse are the expert group and task force. They are guided by Bureau, who looks at the administrative function of the IP base and multidisciplinary expert panel. They look at the technical side of what the IP base does and they report to plenary, those member states uh, who form the plenary and they give the agenda to IP base and they also receive the output coming from the IP base in order to bring it to policy and practice. And of course there are other observers like other UN organizations or any independent organizations, NGOs, they can be also act as an observer to this. So coming to what I'm going to talk about it, and one of the fundamental uh, tasks of IPVS is assessment. So basically what it means, they look at global, regional, and thematic type of assessment means, which is we can look at the literature, we can talk about what is in the literature, we can review the literature, then we can synthesize it, and then assess the evidence base based on some criteria and develop the message. So that's one of their fundamental tasks. And then they also provide policy support tools, like different type of tools that help policymakers to make decisions, identify relevant policy support tools and methodologies. As an example, uh, Dave is here, Dave's infer might be one of the tools they can refer to. Similar to in the ecosystem services space, they have different type of tools. Natural capital, the people in the University of Minnesota developed certain type of tools. Similarly, people in Vermont University, they have developed some other tools. So this type of tools, how they can be applicable to a particular policy context. So they also look at that. Capacity building in this space. So maybe um, depending on the need of the country, sorry, there's something going on, which I need to keep that pace. Um, need of the country, they also assist in capacity building and knowledge generation, which is identifying knowledge needs of policymakers and catalyze effort to generate new knowledge. So the whole idea is trying to be policy relevant in their work through a range of assessments. And so far, IPBES has uh, conducted, I believe, eight different assessments. The first one was about pollination. They looked at the scenario of pollination, how important pollination is, what's happening to the pollination and pollinators, how it affects the agriculture and other type of uh, industry that we have. Then they also looked at scenario and modeling of biodiversity and ecosystems. Then they ran a regional assessment on biodiversity and ecosystem services, focusing on four different regions, Asia Pacific, uh, Europe and Central Asia, South America, sorry, Africa and America. And at the same time, this assessment on land degradation and restoration was done in parallel to those regional assessments. And now, just last May, they finished what they call global assessment of biodiversity and ecosystem services. So that's the fundamental work they are doing now. In the next phase, they are going to put more emphasis on policy support tools, capacity building, and so forth. So that's all about the IPBS. So I'm gonna pick on this particular assessment that was uh, done um, since 2015 up until 2018. What is it? What did we find? And of course, I have to acknowledge up front is what I'm talking here is I'm only a small contributor to the whole process. So the, the all other experts or people involved in this have contributed to this and I'm sharing the message on their behalf. So they, they need to be duly acknowledged and at some point I'll mention or show who they are. Um, what is land degradation and restoration assessment? It was actually demanded by the um, parties, which means the countries in 2015. Um, 100 members at the time, so now it's 130, plus 80 participating organizations, they demanded or requested IPBase to run this assessment. Then IPBase uh, announced the call and recruited 150 leading experts from 55 countries. They worked for three years from 2015 to 2018. They assessed over 4,000 different sources, the scientific papers, government reports, indigenous and local knowledge sources and so forth to come up with what is happening to land, why land is degrading, what, we, what sort of impact we are having and how we can respond to it. And reviewed over in three different cycles involving 7,300 comments from external reviewers, scientific bodies, and government. It was co-chaired by Bob uh, Scholes of um, South Africa. He has been working in climate change space uh, extensively. And another expert from FAO, Luca Montanarella, they chaired it, and there were 17 
coordinating lead authors, 60 lead authors, seven young fellows working in different chapters, and 16 review editors, editors like journal editors looking at individual chapters, two editors per chapter, and many more contributing authors contributed to this exercise. And this is the team, and they finally developed two documents. One is called Summary for Policymakers, which is policy-relevant message, what they get uh, out of this um, exercise for the policymakers. Another is the technical content of the assessment, which is called assessment report and in eight different chapters. So what I'm going to do is to give you a bit of a tips of the summary for policymakers. Um, the chapter-wise, uh, it, it won't be, it, it is foolish for me to uh, tackle that issue, but I'll try to give you the gist of what we find as a message to the policymakers through this assessment. And there are some criteria in order to <laughs> make those messages relevant to policymakers. So you have uh, maybe 800, 900 page documents, and you need to bring it to a very small document that policymakers or their advisors can look at it. So it's a short document that highlights the important messages of the evaluation responding to the original objective. The original objective refers here is the scope that the uh, countries gave to the IP base, and we are responding to that scoping document, or sc the objective set out in that scoping uh, work. A key message uh, has to be politically relevant, but not prescriptive, is based on the main results of individual chapters contains parenthesized references to report sections for traceability and is supported by evidence from scientific literature and given with confidence level to improve transparency and trust in the main message. So this is the what they call their confidence um, level establishing matrix here. You have level of agreement in the literature from low to high and you have quantity and quality of the evidence from low to robust. If you have a robust evidence base, a lot of um, paper or a lot of evidence talking about it, and uh, there is a high level of agreement in all those papers, then that sort of message is called well established. On the other hand, there is a low level of agreement in the, mess uh, in the papers or the sources um, we are looking at, and low level of um, low volume of the work itself, then it is inconclusive. That's how they convey this message to policymakers. So in a summary, I'm going to go over five dot points to summarize what are the key findings that we reported in SPM. The first one is, which is obvious, uh, all of us know this, there are instances of land degradation in virtually every ecosystem type in the world and in every country, except Antarctica, everywhere we see the evidence of land degradation. The severity and consequences of land degradation vary depending on the social and ecological context and when the degradation has taken place. So depending on the time when it is started and more fundamentally the context. The context is the king here. What is happening in a particular setting depends on the other parameters at that particular context. So context determines the severity and consequences of degradation. The problem is ongoing and worsening rather than improving as the demands we place on land increases and its capacity to satisfy them is progressively and persistently weakened. So land is being degraded, our demand is increasing on land-based resources. So the problem is not uh, alleviating or improving, it's ongoing and further worsening because of the other reasons I'll mention momentarily. Present effort to address the problem had demonstrated that it is possible to make a difference. We have plenty of successful examples um, globally, locally, we can find them, but the current level of effort we are putting in in order to address this problem is far from what is needed. So the, the whole description and the detailed messages uh, can be traced back through this link and uh, there is a document what we call uh, summary for policymakers with uh, very guided messages. So if you are interested to look at in more detail, certainly you can take through, you can look at this link and uh, look at the final document. But I'll go over some of the key messages, what we, what we got from this and what we conveyed. Before I do that, what are the causes we identified in this process? One is the overconsumption of ecosystem derived good is the fundamental reason. Looking at the evidence base, we came up with the idea that this is one of the reasons why land is being degraded. 
partly driven by continued population growth, but mostly by growth of demand per capita. It's not population to blame for land degradation per se. It's our consumption habit and the demand, increasing demand per capita. That is one of the reasons. Decoupled consumption and production systems. Production of soybean is happening in Brazil. They clear the, clear the forested land, but it's consumption for whether it is animal feed in China or somewhere for some other purposes somewhere else. So the system has decoupled. Consumption and production systems has decoupled, and that is another reason why we see land is being degraded. Failure to perceive land degradation as a key issue. I think this is in one of the chapters. Chapter two talks about the concepts and perception around land degradation and restoration. They found that considering land degradation as an important issue is not there in many people's minds. So the perception is not there. The land is being degraded to this extent. That sort of perception is not there. That's also an issue. And arguments about failure to perceive land degradation as a key issue and arguments about its definition and causes. So if we talk about restoration ecologists, and there are two camps, as I believe, based on my limited understanding, there are arguments about how to define some of the things also. So that's also a part of the problem. Fragmented policy responses and negative incentives. So we know we try to tackle this problem, but we don't do it in a holistic way. We take one sectoral approach to address this problem, and that's also part of the problem, and negative incentives. So we know that um, subsidy to fertilizer reuse, subsidy to pump um, under, sorry, groundwater, and different type of subsidies are creating some different impact on the land, but we are continuing that. And worsening climate change is on top of this, the changing climate is the another culprit. So, that is the causes and the key points, but I'll take you now to some of the key messages, what we passed on to the policymakers, and give you some flavor of what is the content within that message. The first one is land degradation is a pervasive and systemic issue. Halting and fixing it should be an urgent priority. That's what we have said as a message to the policymakers because it negatively impacts the well being of 3.2 billion people out of 7.7 .7 billion we are now. I just checked this morning, it was 7.7 .7 and then the rest, but out of that, almost 50% of us are impacted. Only 25% of the Earth's land surface is substantially free from human alteration, but the 75% of the land surface has been altered in terms of cropland, managed forest, grazing lands, and so forth. More than 1.5 billion hectares of natural ecosystems have been converted to croplands in recent past. By 2050, less than 10% of that land surface will remain intact. The hidden cost of land degradation amount to about 10% of the annual global gross product. So we are having an economy of more than 80 trillion at the moment, so 10% of that would be the hidden cost because of land degradation. This is uh, the same thing in a pictorial uh, in, in, in some sort of picture we are trying to show you, human appropriation of production of biomass. This color, the intensity of color indicates compared, compared to the original scenario, the percent of potential NPV. So if we see a gray area, we don't have data. So this is about human appropriation of production of biomass, where those things are heavily, um, highly appropriation. Here we see the relatively intact wilderness area, that 25% I just mentioned. Here we see uh, an indicator of land degradation in some way, the change in soil organic carbon, which is uh, um, soil organic carbon can be considered as one of the indicators of land degradation. So darker the color, we have changed it completely as opposed to its original condition. So 90% reduction on that. So here we have percent of species lost from original condition to 2005. So land degradation has some impact on species richness, but that link is perhaps not that direct as we, uh, as we can see in many other instances. Why the species came into picture is partly because the way IPBS has defined land degradation and restoration is too comprehensive. The biodiversity ecosystem services are part of that definition, so we, we have to cover this aspect as well. The second message we conveyed is land degradation endangers other species too because of the definition. Uh, so land degradation 
So degradation of the Earth's land surface through human activities is the top cause of biodiversity loss, whether habitat conversion or exploitation of the uh, natural resource base. This is a relatively old data, um, which is the, the global assessment has released their findings in May, but this was based on the, our assessment last year. About 34% of the global, global biodiversity loss has been happened by 2010 in terms of the abundance of species. Recent transformation of natural ecosystem has occurred in some of the most species rich habitats or ecosystem in the world. So we are increasing pressure on biodiversity um, through transformation. The another message uh, of what we conveyed is there are strong two-way interactions between land degradation and climate change. So the interaction is two-way and there is a strong interaction between these forces. Between just in a decade from 2000 to 2009, land degradation was responsible for annual global emission of up to 4.4 billion tons of carbon dioxide. Deforestation alone, which is part of the forest land degradation, 10% of the human induced greenhouse gas emission. Halting and reversing land degradation can provide more than one third of the most cost effective greenhouse gas mitigation activities to, be, to keep global warming under two degrees centigrade. Sorry. Uh, the combination of land degradation and climate change projected to reduce the global crop yield by 10% by 2050, but in some areas it could reduce by 50%, like in some Sub-Saharan African region, forcing up to 700 million people to migrate. So the other reason we found in the literature is land degradation is not a local phenomenon, of course. It is not only affecting the productivity of the land, it is forcing people to migrate. So that's how uh, the land degradation is surfaced in, in terms of um, different things we observe. This particular graph, um, which try to relate the sustainable development goals, the 17 sustainable development goals we have, and their relevance to land degradation to target of each sustainable development goal. I don't have a full confidence on it because this was ref just released in 2015 and we assessed the documents from 2015 to 2018 or end of 17 based on what we learned from there. So the confidence is not great here, but it gives a bit of a link between all of these sustainable development goals and its link to land. So obviously the goal number 15, which is life on land is very much tightly related to what is happening or to land and what, how that will relate to achieving or not achieving this goal. So it will affect almost 100%. Similarly, if you look at the other end, good, um, good health and well-being is less related to land degradation than this. So just to give a bit of a sense of the link between land degradation and the sustainable development goals. So now I'm going to touch on some of the things which are different than what we have seen in many cases of this type of exercise. Land degradation itself might have been looked at by UNCCD for, for years, but what's the difference with the IP-based work? The, fun, the first one is defining degradation as a persistent loss of productivity, ecosystem services, and biodiversity. That was the definition given to the assessment team. So it's a broader definition than just reducing productivity of land due to uh, anthropogenic and natural causes. So the key elements of this definition goes back to the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment. And there is a notion of this persistence, poor reversibility, or not swiftly self-correcting. That's the situation. The link to reduction in ecosystem services which is now in IPBS language, they refer it as the nature's benefit to people, or sorry, nature's contribution to people, which are the benefits people derive from nature. So they are linked to Millennium Ecosystem Assessment. It is highly aligned with the definition of UNCCD, uh, sustained productivity loss, that was the definition of UNCCD. The eruption of biodiversity in the IPBS definition potentially introduces ambiguity. It frequently happens that our desired service increases, but biodiversity decreases or vice versa. If we think from monoculture plantation to biodiversity, productivity of timberland increases due to monoculture, but biodiversity decreases and so forth. If the definition is interpreted as or, like uh, if productivity or ecosystem services or biodiversity, then the whole world is degraded. So we will see in that way. But in order to avoid that ambiguity, 
we can be a bit more explicit saying that with respect to productivity loss, the land is degraded, or with respect to ecosystem service loss, the land is degraded, or with respect to biodiversity. So this is our suggestion because of, of some sort of ambiguity in the definition itself. The other things that this particular exercise did was the land degradation and restoration assessment makes a distinction between the transformation and degradation. Land, natural state of ecosystem can be con completely transported to something else. Forested land converted to crop land, for example. They can be degraded. Forest land can be degraded to variably degraded state of the same type of land. Even the transformed land can be degraded. Crop land can degrade. It came from far natural state, become a crop land. Crop land can degrade through use. So in order to address that through restoration or rehabilitation, we can change the course of variably degraded state of the transformed land to maybe a more intact state of transformed land. Through restoration and rehabilitation, then we might be able to go back to the original state. Or variably degraded natural system can be also traced back to the natural state uh, through uh, restoration and rehabilitation. So the idea of degradation and transformation have been quite clearly dealt separately. The another additional element of this is reframing land degradation as having both international causes and consequences as well as local. So teleconnections are an important driver of degradation. I alluded earlier example of soybean production in Brazil, how that's going to end up with um, some consumption in different part of the world. Uh, results from the export of demand and global trade separates the consumer from the consequences of consumption. We consume something, but where it is produced, how it is produced, how it is affecting the land, that is, that is not linked. Well, intended policies in one area could have unintended consequences in other parts of the world. And similarly, the consequences of degradation are also exported as dust, pollution, novel disease, climate change, and the migration of disparate people. This is the consequence of land degradation, but that's not only happening in a local place, and that is also exported. And the existence of global causes does not absolve local land stewards from their responsibility. It doesn't mean that there are global causes and consequences. We can remain free or we can, we, we, it's not affecting us. That's not the issue. So it won't free local people taking a stewardship of the land. And the fourth newness of the IPBS work is the recognition of indigenous and local knowledge. This is a brave IPBS experiment. So it was, uh, I think in this scale, it was the first time they tried to bring local and indigenous knowledge system at par with the scientific knowledge, the way they have defined, but it is very hard to do well. Uh, a great deal has, can be accomplished simply by asking and listening respectfully to local and indigenous people's concern about this and maybe we learn a lot from that and help to mitigate the problem. Indigenous knowledge tends to get more attention in this exercise compared to the local knowledge, but the latter might be more important in terms of the number of people who, are, who can be engaged in this process. But this is some sort of newness that IPBS has brought in in terms of their assessment. Then enlarging the scope of land degradation beyond dry land. So historically, when you talk about UNCCD, then it's more about, uh, especially in Africa, the dry part of the world. But it, it enlarged that scope. As a result, it became, uh, if we think from UNCCD point of view, particularly focusing on Africa, what it ended up with, it became a marginalized and gateways of far away problem of local concern and object of charity for many many situations. But the reality is land degradation of course in all ecosystems, often it is not noticed because it is gradual uh, or happened uh, long ago or the lost services have been substituted from somewhere else. So what are the responses and options to address this problem? So there are a series of response and options we have talked in the report, but some of the fundamentals one are improved monitoring and verification system on the land. So we don't have a good monitoring and verification system, what's happening to the land. So we need to establish that sort of systems and have it or looked at periodically. The second one is coordinate policies between different authorities with an interest on, in land. 
agriculture, forestry, energy, water, environment, infrastructure, all these service agendas, they need to be linked and look at holistically if we want to address this problem. The sectoral approach has proven failure in many cases. Eliminate perverse incentive and promote positive incentives like the fertilizer subsidy or uh, irrigation pump subsidy in many cases where they draw underground water. So this is the, the challenge that the policymakers have to address and that might be the way to minimize or mitigate the problem. The other way to look at is act across multiple scale of interventions, not at only at local. So have a synchronized approach to look at from global to local, but we have to look at at all levels. In terms of the assessment, the global to national type of approaches have been looked at in chapter eight, which talks about policies, decision support, regulatory and economic measures, and so forth. The land custodians to national level approaches have been looked at in chapter six, which is more about context, context specific situation, what type of practices are there, which are working, which are not, and why. So, um, Investing in restoration is a sound economics. So we found that, of course, uh, we know restoration has economic, social, and ecological benefits, but purely from economic point of view, benefits of restoration exceed the cost by many fold. Some of the examples include, if we look at the biome level, and uh, based on the evidence, at the global level, the benefit of restoration are estimated to exceed the cost by an average of 10 to 1. In several Asian and African countries, the cost of inaction, not taking action, has been estimated to be 3.8 to 5 times higher than the cost of taking action. So the cost of not doing anything is way higher than doing things. And of course, the first principle, prevention is better than the cure. Avoiding degradation is even, even more beneficial. So the full report looks like this. So if you, if you are interested in it, these different chapters talk about different aspects of the assessment. Um, so the full report is available through this link in the IPBS website. Uh, that's, that's all from me. Thank you.